Life Audio. When we are able to open our eyes in the morning and say, I am happy because I get to worship God. I'm happy with what God has given me. I'm happy with where he has settled me. And I'm happy with the work I have today. When we can do that, what we're doing is we're placing ourselves humbly before God. And we're aligning our hearts and our lives with the fact that God himself has chosen the times and places that we are to live, that God has placed us somewhere, even when we are in a very difficult situation, God is giving us something to learn from. Have you ever struggled with being content? Have you ever had that secret little thought in your mind that's like, if I only had more, if I could only get more, if I only had that thing, then I would be at peace. Well, today, my friends, we're going to talk about the superpower of contentment as found through the book of Ecclesiastes. Welcome to How to Study the Bible. My name is Nicole Eunice. I am your coach, your host, your pastor here as we look at God's word together and discover what he has for us. And today, he's got some great stuff for us that's incredibly relevant for what we might call the American dream, the idea that if we have more, we will be happy. And you may think to yourself, oh, no, I don't fall for that. Like, I know that's not really, that doesn't really work. But truly, our whole lives are absolutely bombarded with the message that there is just one more thing around the corner that if you get that thing, you will experience peace. You can be content. That thing might be a promotion. It might be a pair of shoes. It might be that next house. All around us, we are receiving the messages that if we hustle a little bit more, peace is right around the corner. But I'm going to sort of submit that let's let's see what the teacher has to say to us, the teacher of Ecclesiastes has to teach us today about what it means to be content. Hey, happy Valentine's Day, Gospel Ranters. We're doing a special Gospel Rant series, February 12th, 19th, and 26th, called What's Love Got to Do With It? So are you in love? You want to be? You were? God made us to really, really enjoy love. It's a special gift from our gracious creator. It's, and it's largely a brain thing. In the first podcast of the series, we're going to look at the neuroscience behind love. I mean, why does your pulse rate rise even when you're just thinking about them? Why do you get stupid? You know, the you can't think of anything else. Why is falling out of love so brutal? In the second podcast, we're going to look at the history of the thinking about love. Did you know that the Romans were afraid of love? I mean, funny story. In the final podcast, we're going to clear up the massive confusion surrounding agape versus eros. I mean, you've heard that agape is God's love and eros. Well, (laughs) you know, but what if we're wrong about that? Are you intrigued? Check it out. So roses are red, violets are not. Some podcasts are for lovers. Give Gospel Rant a shot. See you lovers then. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes 5 and 6 today, and you can read the whole thing in your Bible, but I'm going to read us a shorter selection from that section of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at it together. So Ecclesiastes 5, here we go. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. This goes on verse 19. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. So as we move forward in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you recall from our last couple of episodes, we've talked about this idea of vanity, vanity, all is vanity, or this this sort of, we might call it like a despairing concept that 
there's no way to figure out how to live a good life on this earth. I mean, the teacher in this wisdom text is basically saying, hey, I've tried all the ways that it seems like you would find to live a good life. I've tried to work hard. I've tried to indulge all of my pleasures. I've tried all these things. And what I've come up with is that we have to rightly number our days under God's plan and under God's sovereignty, right? And so as the book sort of rolls out, it's not going to proceed in a linear fashion. It's definitely poetry. It definitely circles around different concepts. But the concept today that I want us to see that shows up again and again in the book is around the idea of money, wealth, and work, and what it means to work hard and to get what you get. And we've got this whole kind of you know, reflection on what it means to have money. And it starts with this idea, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. There's a lot of studies out there and a lot of information out there that talk about how actually the, although people with wealth may give more dollars, they actually give less percentage of their wealth. There's something about adding to your money that makes it harder to give it away. And this is just a reality in our world right now. And back in the day, more than 2,000 years ago, here the teacher is saying, hey, here's a concept. If you love money, you're never going to have enough of it. And we need to remember there's money in itself is not bad. It's not it's it's not a bad thing. It's a tool, right? It's a tool, but it's also a tool that has a lot of power and it has a lot of power to corrupt us as human beings. And one of those ways that it corrupts us is in believing that we can buy our happiness that we can buy contentment, that we can buy power and fulfillment. And I think what we really read here is this idea that like people who are wise understand that that's not actually the way that it works. In verse 12, we see this little phrase, the sleep of a laborer, meaning someone who's like working for the day, you know, hardworking, we might call that like blue collar. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. So here we see this like simple concept, like it might seem like it would be better to have more money. But in reality, there's something about the simple life that makes it easier to rest in the world. What's interesting about this wisdom is that it's backed up in our recent day. So there was a study recently that said that after reaching a certain annual income, so after getting to a a six-figure, let's say, income in the U.S., people are actually likely to have worse life satisfaction, reduced well-being, and children of affluent parents are more likely to suffer from anxiety, substance abuse, depression. So if you think of it as a bell curve, the, the, the bell on the side of the bell is poverty is not a good place to be. In the middle is sort of the middle class. And then on the other side of the bell curve is affluence. And actually, the worst place to be is either very poor or very rich. And why would that be? It doesn't sound like it would happen that way. But in reality, more money can lead to more isolation from other people. More money leads to more desire to have more things. And after they have more things, we think they're going to make us happier. And we think that we need to buy something else to continue to make us happier, bigger and better. When in reality, you know, sort of material possessions don't make anyone happy. That's been studied time and time again. So what we find out is that there's a lot of wisdom in what's being said here in the book of Ecclesiastes, that it may seem like more and more wealth is going to make you happy, but in the reality, this abundance creates less happiness. And so then we get a conclusion, right? We get sort of like, how then can I be content? Where is contentment found if not in our possessions? And it says in verse 19, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is a gift of God. And I feel like right there, if we were going to write down those three things, the ability to enjoy what we have, the ability to accept our lot in life, as in I am satisfied with where I am, and the ability to be happy in our toil. I am happy to do the work that I do. So I am happy with what God has given me. I am happy with where I am positioned. And I am happy with the work I have to do today. Like this is a gift of God. The secret of contentment often lands squarely in a place of the mindset that we have for our days. And the reality is like you can be a person who doesn't make a lot of money, who maybe doesn't even have a job that seems that fulfilling and have an amazing attitude about it. Or you could be a person who has an enormous amount of wealth and a job that everyone thinks would be so awesome to do. And you can be tremendously unhappy. 
Because those are not the things that actually determine our happiness. Our ability to be satisfied with the life that we have is the secret of contentment. If we turn to the New Testament and we think about what we learn about contentment in Christ, we read this in Philippians 4, verse 11. Not that I have ever been in need, but I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So here we have the true secret of contentment that we find in Jesus, that when our identity is squarely with Christ, when our understanding of life is based on what Christ has said makes a good life, when we are able to open our eyes in the morning and say, I am happy because I get to worship God. I'm happy with what God has given me. I'm happy with where he has settled me. And I'm happy with the work I have today. When we can do that, what we're doing is we're placing ourselves humbly before God and we're aligning our hearts and our lives with the fact that God himself has chosen the times and places that we are to live, that God has placed us somewhere. Even when we are in a very difficult situation, God is giving us something to learn from. Like Paul says in Philippians, I have learned what it is to live on nothing or to live with everything because that's not actually the metric that I use anymore. The metric that I use is that I can do everything through Christ, that because of Christ, I have a new identity. I have a new outlook on life. I have a new perspective on time. Because of Christ, I have a new understanding of what fulfillment looks like. What did Jesus say fulfillment looks like? He said, fulfillment is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. We all have the ability to do that. It doesn't matter if we're driving a delivery truck or teaching a classroom of children, or home caring for aging parents, or between jobs. Wherever we are, we all have the opportunity to redefine what it looks like to do good work. Christ has given us this new perspective and this new understanding of how we get to live in the kingdom of heaven in the here and now, in each of the days that we have. So even when we look at this book of wisdom literature, when we look back at what the teacher is telling the assembly about the reality of wealth, we see these treasures of knowledge about contentment that pull all the way through into the New Testament, where we find in Philippians 4 what it actually means to be content with whatever we have. Hi, I'm Beckett Cook, host of The Beckett Cook Show. I lived as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years until I had a radical encounter with Jesus 13 years ago. Since then, I've gotten my master's degree in seminary and published a book called A Change of Affection. On my podcast, The Beckett Cook Show, I sit down with fascinating Christian scholars and thinkers to address the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. To start listening now, go to lifeaudio.com or search for The Becca Cook Show on your favorite podcasting platform. So as you think about what this means for you today, certainly there is the immediate application for you to examine your relationship with money and ask yourself, do I hold on tightly to money? Have I held on to it more tightly as I've gained more wealth? If that's your story, if you've been blessed with more, have you found yourself holding on to more? Has money made you happy? Has it given you what you want? Or is it possible that it's time to redefine your relationship with money, to see it as a tool that God has provided you in which you can ask yourself, how am I using the tool that God has provided me to advance the kingdom of God? And if you want to know what your relationship is with money, just give some away. Like if, if you're not sure how you're doing in the area of money, give some away and see how that feels. Give away a little bit more than you think that you can, because that's what helps us release our grip. And as we go through life, we can find ourselves just quietly and subtly starting to grip on to the things that we used to think were, were gifts. We can start to feel entitled that they belong to us and that we have to have them. And one of the best ways to break that is to truly become a cheerful giver, just to give money away. If that's not the best application for you, another possible application point would be to ask yourself, am I living with contentment? When I think about this day, am I entering into this day saying, thank you, God, I am satisfied with where you have me. I am satisfied with the work you've given me. I am satisfied with the place 
that you've settled me. And if you're not satisfied, one of the places to start is with confession, just to say to God, I know I'm not I'm not settled and I know that I don't bring contentment to my world and my life. Would you help me grow in that area? And our God is so good and so gracious. I believe that's a prayer he will answer. Talk with you guys next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time, especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff, and even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Ramp Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com.